I want to start by saying this story is totally true. I know a lot of people say that for effect, but this one really is. Do I believe every single thing that happened? Not really. I'm as skeptical as you'll be, and I'm open to any explanation that says it wasn't supernatural. Maybe it was just a big prank by my friends, but there are reasons why I doubt that. Could it have been mass hysteria? Who knows? Anyway, here's the story. I joined the army in 2009 and did my training at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Most soldiers at Fort Huachuca are really smart. The jobs there need high test scores. So the friends I made there were a special group. Many of us were into gaming. Huachuca is about 20 minutes from the Mexican border and 40 minutes from the famous Tombstone, Arizona. One day we were bored and telling ghost stories. One of my friends, let's call him Jackson, bought a Ouija board at Walmart for us to mess around with. I'm not sure if Jackson believed in ghosts, but when you have too much money and free time, you buy silly stuff to entertain yourself. Jackson and I tried using the Ouija board in our barracks because it was really old and people said it was haunted, but it didn't work because our barracks were brand new. Tired of going to strip clubs and hanging out near the Mexican border, we wanted to do something different. I suggested we go to Tombstone, a nearby town. Jackson got excited because he had heard about a haunted house there. We all agreed to go ghost hunting and invited our friend Thompson to join us. We got to Tombstone after dark. It wasn't exactly what I expected. I thought it would be like a real ghost town with old Wild West buildings and tumbleweeds blowing down the street. That's not how it was at all. Even at night, it's just a regular town with a few old buildings and touristy spots. Besides the downtown area, there's a neighborhood like any other small town in America. That's where we went looking for the so-called haunted house. We got to the area we thought it was in, but we weren't sure which house it was. After circling the block for a bit, we decided to take a break to pee. Everyone went off in different directions to pee, but I couldn't find a private spot, so I didn't go. I was the second person back in the car. I climbed into the back seat and asked Jackson, Where's Thompson? I don't know, he's been gone for a while. I'll text him, Jackson said. Suddenly Thompson, who looked even paler than usual, came sprinting towards the car trying to open the passenger door. Jackson calmly unlocked it and Thompson jumped in, looking frantic. What happened? Jackson asked. Dude, you're not gonna believe this, Thompson gasped, his southern accent getting tense like a tight string on a cello. I was in this old creepy house, right? And I decided to check it out. I even lit up a smoke. But then, out of nowhere, something touched my shoulder. Whoa, what was it? I asked. Nothing. I mean, there was nobody there. I bolted back to the car. Feeling pumped with adrenaline, curiosity, and maybe a bit of stupidity, I suggested we go full mystery machine mode. We parked in a nearby lot and pulled out the Ouija board from the car. As soon as we found a spot to park about half a block away, we eagerly took out the Ouija board and put it on our laps. Since I was chosen to ask questions, I started, is there anyone here? To my surprise, the planchette started moving. It slowly moved towards yes. Were you the one who touched Thompson, I asked. Yes, it replied. Are you the ghost from the haunted house we were about to check out? No, it answered. Now, this really surprised me. If someone was trying to scare us, why wouldn't they go along with it? They could claim to be the ghost we saw and start freaking us out. It's like if a scammer tells you about a fortune you inherited, and then when you ask for more money, they say no. I started remembering all those creepy Ouija board stories I'd heard. They always started with basic questions like, how did you die, and ended with scary stuff happening. But I didn't want this to be like that. We were smart people, not scared kids. If this was real, I wanted it to be different. So I took a moment to think, what could I ask that wasn't cliche? What questions would lead to clear answers? Without any creepy stuff, I realized I had to ask really specific questions, ones that couldn't be twisted into something scary. I could ask about the coefficient of pi, but the ghost might just say something scary. But I trusted the ghost, so I asked my first question. Name one thing the building you touched, Thompson Inn was used for. The planchette started moving again. I thought, this can't be that creepy. Maybe it would say something normal like general store or post office. But then it spelled out S-L-A-U-G-H-T-E-R. That gave me chills. If my friends were playing a joke, they'd probably pick a different word. 
Slaughter isn't something people use often anymore. I asked why it touched Thompson. It spelled out H-E-L-P. That was creepy, so I asked when it died. It said 1867. I remembered reading somewhere that you're not supposed to ask a Ouija board about God, so I asked why. It quickly replied no. Trying to be creative, I asked what class it, it would play in World of Warcraft. I thought it would say Undead Warlock, but it just said no again. It was strange. Even though the entity couldn't talk to us directly, you could almost feel its tone of voice through how it moved the planchette. I wanted to keep asking questions, but our first sergeant interrupted us with a frantic phone call. He ordered us all back to base because someone had lost their weapon. Disappointed, we packed up and went back. The next day, we told the others in our platoon about what happened the night before. Most of them didn't believe us, but another soldier named Green was interested. So we decided to try talking to the ghost again and brought Green with us. He had an SUV, which would give us more space to set up the board. As a soldier, my first thought was to plan our arrival and departure time, as well as safety measures, especially after the previous night. I told the group that if anything creepy happened, we needed to have a plan in place to surprise the spirits. Our ghost hunting plan was, at around 8 p.m., we'll leave for Tombstone so we arrive after dark. We'll take two vehicles, Green's SUV and Jackson's coupe. Jackson and Thompson will ride in the coupe, while Green and I will be in the SUV. We'll set up our session in the SUV so we can leave quickly if anything spooky happens. We agreed on our plan. We'd leave any weapons or sharp objects behind at the base. Spirits could only harm others by using objects, so without them around. The only danger would be scaring us so much we'd wet our pants. If any of us felt super creeped out or sensed danger, we'd give a signal to leave quickly. Each soldier would go back to their vehicle and head straight back to base. Once we left, we'd call each other right away to make sure everyone was okay and talk about what just happened. So we were all set. Arizona's finest soldiers were ready to face the undead. We parked in the same spot as the night before and got out our Ouija board. There were four of us now, and we were feeling confident. But I'll be honest, I was really nervous. Everything I thought I knew about life and the universe was shaken up by what we saw the night before. It felt surreal, like something out of a movie. Green was especially nervous because he was raised Catholic. Even though he wasn't religious anymore, he still had that fear of Ouija boards ingrained in him. Green decided to just watch as we set up the board. Three of us were going to use it. We started by asking if anyone was there, and we got a slow, strained yes in response. Then I asked if it was the same being we talked to last night, and it said no. I wanted to mess with the ghost's head, so I asked it something unexpected. I wanted to find out if it had any weaknesses. After all, even though it seemed all-powerful, it must have limits, right? So I asked, what is one thing you want that you cannot have? Its answer, life. I felt like an idiot for asking. Before I could figure out if I was feeling ashamed or just plain stupid, the light inside Green's brand new SUV flickered. I couldn't believe it. That doesn't just happen. The only time I've ever seen a light flicker in, a car was when it was being started. This was getting too real. It felt like the spirit was taking charge, showing who's boss. After I calmed down a bit, I started thinking of more questions. You've been asking all the questions, let me try, Thompson challenged me. Fine, go ahead, I said. What do you want from us? He asked in his strong Georgia accent. S-T-E-V-E, -E, the planchette spelled out. I was terrified. No one there knew my first name except Thompson, and the planchette was moving away from him when it spelled it out. It felt like someone was pulling it with an invisible thread straight from the front of the car, but there was no one there. Before I could react, the center console, which was slightly open, closed by itself. I knew we had to get out of there. Okay, guys, it just spelled out my first name. Let's get out of here, I said. Invoking our military plan of action, no one hesitated. Thompson and Jackson scrambled out of the SUV and into Jackson's Eclipse. Green and I got into the front seat of the SUV. Green quickly shifted into drive and sped out of the dusty lot. It felt like the Ford Escape had never been driven like that before. Both Green and I were in shock. My atheist brain was questioning everything, and Green's devout brain was doing the same. Then, Green's alt-rock ringtone broke the trance. It was surreal hearing pop culture in that moment. 
Green answered the phone. It was Jackson and Thompson. Their car wouldn't start, and they were still in Tombstone. Green slammed on the brakes and made a U-turn so fast it would scare Vin Diesel. He floored the SUV, racing down Arizona 82 towards Tombstone at about 100 miles per hour. Dude, slow down, I yelled. At that moment, I was more scared of Green's driving than the spirits. They're our friends. We can't leave them there, Green shouted. We knew the general way back to Tombstone and got there pretty fast. Tombstone isn't as small as you might think, and we couldn't remember exactly where we parked. As I tried to figure it out, Green suddenly freaked out. Oh my God, he yelled. What's wrong, dude? I asked. I can't, I can't drive the car anymore, he said. What do you mean? I asked, confused. I can't move, he replied. Then, to make things even scarier, I realized we had somehow ended up back at the parking lot where we left. I tried to think logically. Here are two possibilities. One, Green is possessed by a ghost who's mad at me. Two, Green is having a breakdown. Either way, it's not safe. So I started giving him simple commands, hoping to snap him out of it. Green, stop the car, I said firmly. Green, stop the car, I repeated. Green, stop the car, I said again, louder this time. Finally, he stopped the car. I switched seats with him and started driving. Just then, Jackson called to say they were safe, about 10 miles down the road towards base. Green was still out of it, but as we got closer to where it all started, he snapped out of it. It seemed whatever had possessed him left when we got about a quarter mile away. It made me think that if ghosts are real, they can only possess people within a quarter mile range. During the ride, we tried to make sense of what happened. Green said he felt like the ghost wanted me and was telling him to drive down an alley, but he snapped out of it in time. He said the ghost wanted to hurt me and make him do it. If we hadn't left when we did, who knows what could have happened. I asked him why the spirit didn't just kill me itself, and he said, probably because I'm bigger than you and more emotional. You think very logically, so you're harder for the spirit to control. Plus, I was in control of the car. It made sense, but it was pretty scary to think about. If the spirit had succeeded, it would have looked like soldier murders other soldier in tombstone. PTSD suspected. In the news, I bet that's what happens when you hear about mothers suddenly drowning their children in a bathtub or other unexplained murder suicides. It's probably a ghost or spirit, but people blame it on psychosis. On the way back to base, we stopped at a gas station. Green, still not completely himself, opened the hatch of his SUV, took out a sunshade that came with his car, and threw it in the dumpster. Why did you do that? I asked. I don't know, it just felt evil, really evil. He answered, that was the final straw that made me believe this was real. It didn't seem like an elaborate prank anymore. Why would he throw away an expensive part of his car just to freak me out when I was already so stressed? Even though I'm still an atheist, I wonder about the paranormal sometimes. It could be something science hasn't discovered yet. I imagine communicating with a spirit is like trying to talk to an invisible man in the room. He can't touch anything, so his only way to communicate is by blowing on a paper hanging from the ceiling with a fan. He blows it right for yes and left for no. That's probably why they give such slow and brief answers. Ironically, we were in the parking lot for the OK Corral, the famous haunted place where the outlaws had their shootout in the 1800s. From what I can gather, the gunfight happened well after 1867, but remember we talked to two separate spirits. I can't help but wonder if the second one was one of them. Also, I've heard of the ideomotor effect. So if you want to help me find logical explanations for what happened, keep in mind I know about that. But it doesn't explain the light flickering and the console moving. I also know about Occam's razor, and I'd welcome a shave at this point. I think it would save my sanity. My name is Rob. I used to be in the Army in the United States. This is a true story about things that happened while I was in the Army. I'll tell it as best as I remember. I won't say exactly where it happened, because I don't want to cause trouble for the neighborhood. It all started in late 2011. I had just finished basic training. My wife Amy lived in an apartment off base. I stayed on base during the week to finish my training at the Army Aviation Logistics School. After a few months, I finished my training. Then I got some surprising news. The Army was sending me to Hawaii. It was sudden, 
and we didn't have much time to get ready. But luckily, we didn't have a lot of stuff to move. Amy felt stressed about moving so far away on short notice. She had never lived far from family and home before, but she was also excited about living in Hawaii. We were both in our early 20s and looking forward to enjoying the beaches. Before leaving Virginia, we sent our furniture ahead, went on a road trip to visit family, and said goodbye. When we got back to Virginia, we sent our car to Hawaii too. The Army gave us one-way tickets to Hawaii, and off we went. It felt too good to be true. We'd only seen Hawaiian pictures and on TV. It seemed like a place for rich people or couples on honeymoons. When we looked out of the airplane window and saw Waikiki Beach, Diamond Head Volcano, and Pearl Harbor, it was surreal. I closed my eyes and slept. After a long flight, the captain said we were nearing Oahu. When we landed, it was still daytime. The view from above was amazing. The water was crystal clear and blue. We got off the plane. It was close to Christmas and the temperature was in the 70s. We rented a car at the airport, checked into our hotel, and started exploring Pearl Harbor and the rest of the island. Later, we went back to our hotel for the night. I went to the Army base and started a lot of paperwork, got some shots, and attended some introductory meetings. It took a few days, but eventually I finished and was assigned to my new unit. My wife and I found a great place to live in Kapolei. It was a nice rental close to the beach. The neighborhood was quiet and well-kept. Our stuff and our car arrived at the port quickly and we settled in smoothly. My unit was getting ready for a deployment to Kandahar, Afghanistan. This meant lots of work and training. I spent long days at the base and weeks away on other islands for training. Since I was away so much, my wife decided to adopt two dogs from the ASPCA. It was nearby, so she could walk there. Our dogs are pit bull mixes, and despite what people might think about the breed, they're very friendly and loving. The dogs kept my wife company and busy. She trained them and took them for walks on the beach. It helped her pass the time while I was working long hours or away for training. When I was home, my wife and I enjoyed exploring trails and interesting places around the island. One day, we decided to check out the wooded area near our house, called Barber's Point. As we wandered, we came across what looked like large flat areas covered in vegetation. It was hard to tell, but underneath the grass, we could see what used to be a parking lot made of asphalt. We also saw old railroad tracks leading toward the beach with trees growing through the wooden beams. The place felt eerie. It was quiet, but you could almost imagine it bustling with activity in the past. There were probably lots of people working here with noisy equipment and voices filling the air, but now it was silent with only echoes of the past. That night, we looked into the area we had explored we found out it was a staging area for World War II supplies used in battles against the Japanese. It was where they prepared for fights like Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and Tarawa. These battles were about storming beaches and taking fortified positions on Japanese islands. We had heard about haunted places on the island before, but this one felt different. There was something about it that gave us chills. Even though it was quiet, there was still a sense of energy in the air as if something was watching us. The local Hawaiians seemed to know a lot about spiritual things and the island's history, which was sometimes violent. They talked about the night marchers, the ancient warriors who wander the island. People have heard ghostly drums and chanting at night, but nobody can explain it. It's like these ghostly groups move through the night without any real reason. One night, we were bored at home and decided to try using our Ouija board. We wanted to see if we could talk to a spirit on this old island. Is there a spirit here who wants to talk? We asked. The planchette kept moving to yes. Then we asked, are you good or evil? It moved to the picture of the moon on the board. We asked, how did you die? The board spelled out a number. Just to be sure, we asked again. It spelled out the same three-digit number every time we asked. Next, we asked, can you show us a sign that you're here? Suddenly, our floor lamp flickered on, lighting up the dark room like a flash, and then turned off again right away. After that, every question we asked only moved the planchette to the moon again and again. Feeling like we weren't getting anywhere, we said goodbye and called it a night. Things were going well at first, but then things started to change. Our dogs began acting strange in the house. At first, we thought they were just adjusting to their new home. But as time went on, their behavior got creepier. 
One night, we woke up to the sound of growling coming from the foot of our bed. I thought maybe one of the dogs was having a bad dream or hearing noises outside. I used my phone's light to see what was going on. One of the dogs was sitting up tall, ears perked, and staring into the dark hallway near the stairs. It looked like he was staring at something, but there was nothing there when I checked. This kind of thing happened often at night. Then, one night, the growling was really bad. This time, it was coming from near the closet. I sat up and saw my dog glaring up at the attic door. The attic door was just a wooden panel in the ceiling of our closet. I wondered if it was birds or mice up there. I had to wake up early, so I calmed the dog down and went back to sleep. Every weekday, I'd wake up at 4.30 a.m. I'd go downstairs, make coffee, and get ready for morning exercises at the base. While I packed my bag and made lunch, I'd let the dogs outside. Once I was ready, I'd bring them back in, take them upstairs, kiss my wife goodbye, and head to the base. The growling from the dogs continued, but one weekday morning was different. As usual, I woke up at 4.30. The dogs got up, stretched, and seemed excited to go outside. We went downstairs together, but when we reached the bottom of the stairs and turned towards the dark living room, both dogs suddenly froze. I tried to encourage them to come with me, but they wouldn't move. They looked scared, staring at something across room. I followed their gaze and felt a chill as I looked into the dark corner. Even though I couldn't see anything, I felt like there was something there, staring back at me with intense focus. Suddenly, both dogs turned and ran for the stairs as fast as they could. They scrambled up the steps, slipping and scratching, desperate to get back to the safety of the bedroom. I quickly turned on the living room light and looked into the corner, but there was nothing there. It was a strange and unsettling experience. I couldn't explain what had happened, but it left me feeling uneasy. I tried to shake off the feeling as I headed to the base, but I couldn't shake the memory of that empty corner and the fear in my dog's eyes. As I made my lunch in the kitchen, I felt something right behind me. It was like someone was staring at the back of my head, giving me chills. It was creepy, and I knew something was wrong. When I went back upstairs, I found the dogs hiding under the bed, shaking. They were terrified and wouldn't move. Whatever had scared them in the living room had really spooked them. As time went on, my wife started having terrifying sleep paralysis. Our dog Milo, who usually woke us up by growling, stayed by her bedside all night. He wouldn't leave, not even to go outside in the mornings. He guarded her while she slept and even stood outside the bathroom door when she went in there. Despite his presence, she still woke up unable to move or speak sometimes. At first, we didn't think it was anything paranormal, but it became clear that something was going on in her house, and it seemed to be focused on my wife. She felt like someone was watching her from corners or dark rooms. It happened more when I wasn't home or when she was busy. She'd see shadows moving out of the corner of her eye, and the dogs would bark and growl at something they couldn't see. It was like they were looking at someone just around the corner. But there was nobody there. The paranormal stuff got worse. One night, I woke up to growling, but it wasn't from the dogs. It sounded like a deep, demon-like growl coming from the empty space between our pillows. I knew something was there, even though I couldn't see it. The next few days were even scarier. My wife put the dog's food bowls on the floor, and suddenly, one of the bowls flew across the room and crashed into the wall. Dog food scattered everywhere. It was like something invisible was messing with us. I was past being scared. I was angry. It felt like this thing was always around us, watching and messing with us. When we closed our eyes to sleep, it felt like it was standing over us. When we washed our faces, it felt like it was breathing down our necks. Even in the shower, it felt like it was peeking in at us. Sometimes, when we were talking, we'd hear a weird metallic voice mimic us from nearby. One night, I said, I was going to turn on some warm water, and then, out of nowhere, this robotic voice said, warm water. I was fed up. Yeah, yeah, warm water. Shut up, I said, mocking it. This was a whole new level of scary. One day, my wife was lying on the bed with the cat next to her. Suddenly, the cat stood up and went stiff. With its hair standing on end, it started freaking out and staring into the hall. My wife looked where the cat was staring and saw a big black mass coming up the stairs. 
It wandered around the hall and then went into the bathroom outside our bedroom. Then we started hearing these loud voices. They were way louder than anything in our house could make. It sounded like a man yelling frantically through static, but we couldn't understand what he was saying. The first time we heard it, we ran outside, thinking the whole neighborhood would be there, but nobody else seemed to hear it. Not even our neighbors next door. It was crazy, and it kept happening. The dogs would freak out, and the noise was so intense that it made us jump out of our skin. How were the windows not breaking from the sound? Amy's sleep paralysis was still happening too. One night, I sat next to her while she fell asleep on the couch. The dogs were asleep, and the lights were on. Suddenly, I felt that creepy presence again. I looked up and saw a shadow figure with red eyes against the wall behind my wife. I felt rage and stared it down. It crouched and then darted into the dark laundry room. I had finally seen it. This thing was a coward, lurking around at night and running away when confronted. The next morning, I decided to confront whatever it was without turning on any lights. I figured if it liked hiding in the shadows, I'd face it right there. As I walked downstairs, I could feel it lurking in the dark living room, far in the corner. I stared back, hoping to see it. It dashed off to the laundry room as I followed, determined to confront it once and for all. In the laundry room, I saw it for the last time. It was crouched in the corner, looking scared and small. I didn't hold back my anger. You are not welcome here. You are dead. Now get out. I yelled, staring it down. I watched as it seemed to sink into the wall, disappearing like it was falling off a cliff. After that, we never saw it again. My wife's sleep paralysis stopped and things started to go back to normal. The dogs calmed down too. We don't live there anymore, but I'll never forget the strange things we experienced in that house in Hawaii. Many, many years ago, I'd say I was about 26 years old at the time, so this would have been during the start of fall in 1992 or 1993. It was a regular, humid night in the small city of Moreau, LA. The street I lived on was well lit with several street lamps lining the entire way. Even though our asses are grown, we were still kids at heart, and it made it easier for us kids to play hide and seek because it was dark enough in the unlit areas to hide. But there was plenty of light to see someone making a beeline for the base. We had seen it plenty of times before. My friend's sister, who was seven or eight years older than us, liked messing with the Ouija board. But this particular board wasn't the Milton Bradley board you could buy at a nearby Kmart. This board she got from her aunt, who was into voodoo for the fun of it, was bought from an obscure store in the French market area of downtown New Orleans that was well known for its connections to the dark arts. We were always interested when she brought out the board, but we were also very skeptical that she actually spoke to the dead with it. We would tell ourselves and each other that she was the one moving the planchette to the letters. I had never actually touched the board or planchette before, nor did I have any real interest. Even though I didn't think it was real, who wants to be proven wrong about that kind of stuff? After all, there were plenty of horror movies involving witchcraft and dark arts that made me hesitate before making contact with anything related to them. However, that didn't stop me from at least watching. Besides, if things got too creepy, I could always walk away. But there it was, in all its creepy splendor, sitting on a cardboard box that my friend brought out so that we could all gather around to see if his sister was really faking it or not. Something certainly seemed off as he set up the board with the planchette. My friend's cousin swore she saw the planchette move after he set it on the board, even though nobody was touching it. Someone tapped the box and jolted it. Stop making stuff up right? Little did we know what was going to happen that night. We all sat there, looking at the board and planchette. The only one to touch it so far was my friend Joey, and that was only to set it up on the box under one of the street lamps. Nobody really wanted to touch it, but we couldn't chicken out on this, so we decided that we would use a count-out game to determine who would be the first two on the planchette. I made sure that I did the count-out game because I certainly didn't want to touch it, I was pretty good at making sure I always got counted out. Yup, I was that kid. Don't judge me. Finally, only two remained of the eight or so folks out there. Joey, who actually volunteered, and Jamie, 
who I think was suddenly feeling very faint about the idea of actually going through with this. But on they went, placing both their hands on the planchette exactly how we had seen Joey's sister do several times before. For what seemed like several minutes, but in reality was probably only 30 seconds, nothing happened. I remember chiming in that I knew it was fake and that your sister moves it herself. Then, the planchette started to move in the infamous infinity loop around the board. We all kind of backed up about an inch or so with a few woes being let out. Of course, we were ribbing Joey about moving it, but he swore it wasn't him. The next obvious thing was that Jamie was moving it, but she was definitely getting frightened at the whole thing. Her face had turned slightly pale, and I really thought there might be something wrong with her. After about another minute, one kid says to ask the spirit some questions. So the normal round of yes or no questions comes out with the spirit answering them promptly, via the planchette stopping on the requisite answer, then starting back up into the infinity loop again. This all goes on for about five minutes with just asking simple questions until I asked what its name was. Let me note that this could on for quite a while, but in the interest of all, of you, I will shorten it up by telling you all that we had learned through questioning that Lauren was 16 and had drowned in the Mississippi River, which was only about 12 blocks from where we lived. The planchette spells out a name, Lauren. Honestly, I don't remember the name, which is odd to me considering I remember so much detail about that night, but for some reason I couldn't recall the name, but for the sake of the story, I'll say it was Lauren. At this point, we now understood the spirit to be girl, and as the saying goes, there is one in every crowd, this kid Ryan asks if she is hot. We got a good chuckle, but it faded quick as the planchette stopped at no, and then proceeded to spell out cold, before starting its infinity loop back up. At that moment, a very slight chill seemed to blow through where we were at under the street lamp. I remember that cold feeling like it just happened. Even as I sit here typing this, I can feel that cold chill that swept through. It was not like any coldness I had ever experienced, not like a winter wind blowing or the cold feeling of opening a freezer. It literally like the air died or something. Everyone there just hung on that moment for what seemed like forever before another girl asked the spirit if she was there with us. As the planchette stopped on the yes, Jamie released her hands from it and left it Joey. But it didn't stop moving. It kept going back into its now mesmerizing loop, waiting for the next question, or for something else. Jamie couldn't handle it anymore and decided that she wanted to go home. Several of us lived on that street, so it was an easy walk, but three of us there lived another street over and would have to ride bikes on a long, long trek back to their houses. Jamie started to walk to her house, but another girl stopped her. Let's just watch it until it's finished, she said, but Jamie, no longer wanted to be a part of it. However, Ryan convinced her to stick around, and she did, back to the board we all gathered, as Joey sat there with this planchette spinning and spinning in a dizzying fashion. Apparently, when Jamie tried to leave, it agitated the spirit and the planchette started spinning faster. Things were getting incredibly tense and I felt like something bad was going to eventually happen. Ryan was still completely skeptical of it all, and decided to tempt Lauren further. Ryan thought it would be funny to ask sexual questions, which caused the planchette to start spinning a little faster. Joey told Ryan to stop being stupid because it felt like he couldn't hold the planchette if it kept, kept going faster. Ryan responded by saying that he knew Joey, the one moving the stupid pointer in the first place, and that he didn't care about some dumbass spirit. He then yelled at the board and said, if you're really here, then show yourself. As I recall this final moment of that night, I still remember thinking that I have never ran into my house as fast as I did that night. It was probably one of the most daft things I have ever done in my life, but the sheer madness of what occurred called for it. I didn't look back to see if anyone else stuck around, nor did I do the gentlemanly thing of making sure the girls got to their houses. I simply got the most tunneled vision I've ever had and saw only my house, my room, my bed, and that was it. After Ryan had yelled at the board, Lauren decided to show us that she was truly there with us. That same cold that had penetrated deep into our beings earlier on came back again, but that wasn't the only thing. 
As we sat under that street lamp, contemplating that piercing cold, every other light all the way down the street went out at the same time. We all looked at each other for about a split second before the full realization of what had just occurred fully hit us like a fist to the face, and then we all left. I remember hearing the girls screaming, but I never looked back for them. I remember some of the guys yelling, but I never looked back for them either. I only looked forward to getting into the safety of my own home. The next day, I learned that nobody stayed, everyone ran, even Ryan. Joey left the Ouija board at the street lamp, and there it sat all through the night into the next morning. The planchette was on the ground next to the box that the board sat upon. Joey said he let it go when he ran and didn't know what happened to it. Jamie and another girl who stayed at her house that night didn't even sleep, so we didn't see her until later that evening. When it came time for the street lamps to come on, they all came on as usual. We decided that if we just didn't talk about it, we could forget it ever happened and go on. But no, I'm sure it stuck with others just as it has with me. We all got a good tongue lashing from Joey's sister, who told us that we should not have been using it without her, that we were too young and too weak to be dealing with the spirits. Had an older, stronger spirit come to us instead of a young girl, we could have gotten hurt. I don't know about that, and I never will, because let me end this with a joke. What has two thumbs and will never go near another Ouija ever again? This guy right here. <laughs>